That helps a lot. Francis doesn't smell. I've, I've smelled him, and he smells pretty good. So thank you. of life and I was really praying about this morning and really thinking through God what would you want me to say to these guys as they're really embarking on their journey and I was listening to uh, Steve Lungu this morning in the session did any of you guys catch that this morning and today oh well, most of you did that, that was just so powerful you know and I'm listening to his life and listening to his, his story and again I just felt like God was just kind of leading me and directing me in what to say here because one of my biggest concerns when I speak to, to college students is this fear that you're going to waste your life, this fear that you're going to live a boring life. Um, I pastor a church, and many of the people in my church live boring lives. They just do. It's comfortable. It's safe. They know what's going to happen tomorrow. They're planning out their lives so they can have the safest, most comfortable, the fewest surprises as possible. I live in a city called Simi Valley. Simi Valley is one of the safest large, it was voted the, lar the safest large city in America, like several years in a row. It's got one of the lowest crime rates um, in, in the nation. In fact, for a city that size, it does have the lowest crime rate because it's where all the policemen live. You know, it's where all the LAPD live. They want to get out of LA. They want to get out of there. And Simi Valley is just close enough. So, so there's a cop on every block. And so you can't jaywalk, you can't do anything without getting caught. That's my city. And I started getting caught up in this safety thing. And, and I noticed it one, one year, my daughter, when she was, my oldest daughter, I've got four kids. My oldest daughter, when she was like five or so, my wife and I were looking at her out the window. And she was playing in the front yard by herself. But we noticed every once in a while she'd be playing and then she'd go like this. And then she'd start playing again. <laughs> and every once in a while, she'd just freeze, you know, for like 30 seconds. And I'm thinking, wow, she's weird, you know? And when she came in, you know, I mean, at first we just thought it was funny. It was like, wow, look at her. What is she doing? And, and she comes in, and we're like, hey, baby, what were you playing out there? She goes, oh, I'm just picking weeds and flowers and, you know, making cakes and this and that. And we're like, well, but how come you would like, freeze every once in a while. And she goes, oh, every time a car would pass by, I'd pretend I was a statue so they wouldn't kidnap me. I thought, what? You know, but, but I realized, gosh, we, we talk about, you know, we have these fears and these like, hey, be careful when you're out in the street. Someone may take you this or that. And here we are living in the safest city in America. And my daughter's freaked out pretending she's a statue every time a car passes by because she's scared that something might happen to her. And we thought, man, this is what we've ingrained into her. You know, we've gotten caught in this paranoia and this whole idea of safety, so much so that my, wife, my daughter's pretending she's a statue. Uh, something's wrong here. And when I speak to college students, I think, you know, so many people today are obsessed with this whole idea of a life of safety of being comfortable, of making sure we're set up for the rest of our lives, you know. And so, so a lot of you in this room, I'm guessing, just because it was my mentality in college, you know, that I had to fight, is when I speak to college students and I go, hey, what are your goals? And they go, well, I just want to graduate college. Cool. Then what? Well, then I want to get a job, you know, for a few years. Then what? Well, then I want to get married, you know, okay, good, 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 you know, then, then what? Well, you know, then, then we'll have kids and we'll raise our kids and th then what's your goal after that? Well, once I, you know, we have kids, I want to play with them, raise them well, have a nice little home and then, you know, and then they'll see them graduate and then they'll go off to college and then, then we'll have grandkids and then I'll travel the world. Then what? Then I'll die. <laughs> cool. So that's your plan for your life. That's your mentality. That's what you're thinking you're put on this earth to do. It's just kind of live this cookie cutter life and, you know, get this nice retirement, save up your whole life, and then die. 
And that's the mentality of so many students today. And I just go, gosh, is there any desire in you to just live a life of adventure where you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and to put yourself in a situation where you just have no clue what's going to happen tomorrow? Is there any sense in which you want to live by faith? That's one of the things I, that hit me when I was listening to uh, Steve Lungu this morning. It's like, gosh, all the things that he's experienced, all the things that he's done. And, and I really believe it all starts here in college. Because if you can't live a life of faith right now where you're doing some pretty outrageous things, some pretty crazy things while you're in college, man, good luck once you get married and you have kids and everything else. That desire for security and safety just becomes like tenfold, a hundredfold with every kid that you have. You start worrying, worrying, worrying. But right now is the time when you have an opportunity to do some crazy things. Is, is this the freest time of your life? Is the only time when you really experience freedom? Because when you're in high school, you can only do what your parents will allow you to do. And, you know, and so then you've got these few college years where there really are no rules. You're off on your own. You can do anything you want. You can stay up as late as you want. You know, no one's watching to see what time you come in, whether, you're st whether you study, whether you do this or you do that. You know what? You've got these free, few years of freedom, and then, uh, and then you'll get married. Okay? And, things, and marriage is great. Okay? I love my wife. Marriage is wonderful. It's great, but life's never the same. Life's never the same, and, and rightly so, because the Bible talks about that. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7 how the single man or the single woman can just think just clearly and just be totally devoted to God, but once you get married, now you've got this other responsibility. And then once you have kids, you've got another responsibility. And pretty soon it's like I've got I to gotta weigh all my decisions based upon, okay, this is going to be cool with my wife, it's going to be cool with my kids. Is it, college, you're free. And in it, what, what stinks is in most churches, the college ministry is that one area of ministry that's kind of left out. You know, they can have a great high school ministry, you know, but once you're out of high school, there's like nothing for you until you're married. Then we have these young married Bible studies. And so you have like this, you know, eight-year window, you know, it seems, where there's really nothing for these people in the church. And uh, you kind of have to wait till you get married, and then you're in your late 20s, early 30s, and you've kind of missed out on this spiritual growth that's taken place for these years, and you start all over. That's what I have in my church. A lot of people in their late 20s, early 30s, they go, yeah, I've kind of been away from church for 10 years. And I'm going, this, this really stinks, because that was the most effective time in your life. That's when you had the opportunity. And now, you know, I'm dealing with these parents going, well, you know, between running my kids, the soccer and this and that. I just don't have time to serve the Lord. And they wasted these years. So in my church, our whole focus is on these college students. Um, that's why we started a Bible college. I go, these are the years. When we started a college ministry, we, you know, we had like maybe 20 students there. It, 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 within a couple of years, it grew to like eight, 900 college students. And they were fired up. It wasn't just, you know, rah, rah, you know, we love Jesus. You know, it was, uh, it was this hardcore where we would take college students overseas. And I remember my youth pastor, Chuck, took some uh, college students out to Romania. as our first, you know, college, you know, missions trip. And he took like 20 students to Romania. When it came time to get back on the plane, three of the students refused to get on the plane. They said, we're not going back to the state. It's, it's stupid over there. You know, we're just going to get caught up in what our parents did and get in this mortgage and li live this safe life, you know, and be oblivious to the things of the world. Right here, these orphans need us. They said, we're not getting back on the plane. And Chuck's like going, your parents are going to kill me. <laughs> you know, you, you have to, you know, and starts quoting him, man, honor your father and mother, you know, on and on. <laughs> and, uh, and he convinces them. He goes, I promise you, we'll get you back here. Okay, you just get on a plane, come back with me, say goodbye to your parents, and then we'll fly you right back out, okay? You know, and so they agreed. He got them on the plane, they came back, we got them set up, and they flew back. And one of them's still there, you know, this was like four or five years ago. You know, it, it's this whole idea of where does God want me? Where do you, where do you want me to go? What, what, what do you want me to do? This whole idea of living by 
faith. You know, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible. If you want to live a life where you don't, don't require faith, this is what everyone's pursuing. Everyone in America right now is pursuing, I should say everyone, 99% of America, 90, 95%, I believe, of the Christians in America are trying to set themselves up so that they don't have to live by faith. Let me save up enough. Let me get a retirement. Let me work so hard that I got all this retirement so that when I'm 60, I don't have to worry anymore. I won't need God to come through. I don't need anything. Let me get all the medical attention, everything I need so that I don't need God. And I don't have to step out in faith. You know, when I'm in college, let me just work as hard as I can, you know, so that I can get and land this job so I don't have to worry anymore. And I don't have to have faith. And it's really a sad life. It's just a boring life. And I got caught up in it when I was in college. And some of you guys may have heard, you know, have heard me speak before, share about my college years. I, I went to a Bible college, and I got so dead in my faith. It, it, it almost killed me because I was surrounded by all these Christians. And it's like, okay, let's play intramural basketball with a bunch of Christians. You know, let's, uh, you know, get together for Bible study in our dorm. You know, let's hold hands and sing, you know... Lord, I lift your name on high. You know, let's just, let's just hang around all these Christians, let's eat lunch with them, breakfast with them at the cafeteria and everything else. And I just kind of lost my passion. And I realized I, I'm not doing anything that scares me right now. See, because when I read about the, the Christians in Scripture, like, like in, in, uh, in Hebrews 11, you hear about these guys that did some crazy things. Abraham holding a knife to a son going, oh, but by faith I know God promised me that my son's going to be this heir, you know, and, and have this great follow, you know, uh, not an heir. He's going to have uh, all these descendants. I know this. And now God's telling me to kill him. But, but he goes, you know, but I have faith. If I kill him, God will just raise him from the dead. He goes, that's nuts. You're, you're holding a knife to your son's heart and going, this is crazy, but I'm going to kill him because God told me to. And I know that God's going to come through. That's, that's faith. Faith is like Peter going, all right, I'll step out of this boat. I'll walk on top of water, I guess. I'll, I'll try that. I mean, just crazy things. And I keep thinking, about what did that feel like the moment Peter stepped out and stepped on the water going, no way. Think about it. Think about just going to the beach right now, you know, get a little kayak, get down the middle and just step in. What did that feel like? It must have been so intense to be the one guy in history to walk on water and to feel it and to experience it. And the thing in my life I've noticed is when I do something crazy in the name of Jesus, when I do something that takes some faith, that's the only time I really experience God. It's not when I'm comfortable. And so what are you doing right now that requires faith? See, when I was in college and I was feeling that way and feeling like, gosh, everything's so comfortable right now. I just thought, I'm just going to do something crazy. And got in my little car and I just drove down into inner city L.A. And I thought, I'm just going to walk around the block and tell people about Jesus. You know, just just this insane, just scared me to death. And I remember just walking around the block a couple of times going, what am I doing here? I'm going to get killed. You know, and, and the whole time I'm praying, God, don't let anyone hit me. I hate pain. You know, I just, I just don't want, I, I don't mind dying for you, but just make it a bullet. I, I don't want to get beat up. I just hate the thought of being beat up. You know, and uh, just this fear, just this constant fear. But it was like, okay, Lord, man, this is, this is why I came down. I wanted to be in a situation where you had to come through for me. Give me someone to talk to. And I remember this bum comes up to me, you know, just stinky, you know, just gross, comes up and goes, buy me a burrito. I'm like, all right. You know, and I go and I buy him this burrito and he starts, he grabs it, you know, and he starts passing it out to his friend, just breaking into pieces, giving it to all these bums, you know. And then he comes over and he hugs me and he, he kisses me on the cheek. And it was so gross. And he's just going, what could I do for you? And I'm like, well, you get off me. No, I, it, it just, it was like this, oh, uh, you know, hey, nothing. You know, I, and I told him, I go, hey, I just came down here. I mean, I was like 20 years old. And I go, I just came here to tell people about Jesus. And he goes, tell me about him. 
I'm like, all right. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. Man, I just opened up the Bible, and I just started, because I didn't have a message. I didn't know how to preach. I'm just opening up the Bible, just going, you know, I just read whatever I opened to, the Matthew somewhere. I'm like, uh, you know, and then uh, he rose from the grave. Cool, huh? You know, and, and all these bums were sitting there at my feet, like, like 12 of them are sitting there at my feet. I'm in the middle of downtown L.A. with these street people, and I'm just laying out verses from the Bible, and this one guy, J.D., just starts cussing at me. Whole time, just swearing. He goes, get your F and this and that out of here. And I'm like, and then Jesus. <laughs> I just kept reading. Like, what am I doing here, Lord? What am I doing? And I'm, I'm trying to give this message that I haven't prepared to these people I didn't know I was going to meet. And I get this one guy cussing at me, telling me to go home and to shut my effing book. You know, I'm going, what am I doing here, God? You know, and, and finally I just thought, what do I do? What do I do? Do I just keep talking as this guy's swearing? And I finally just thought, okay, I'm going for it. And I just sat down next to the guy. And I go, what's your name? He goes, JD. God, hi, JD. I'm Francis. I go, so you don't believe anything I say? He goes, no, I don't believe all this. You know, just the foulest mouth. And I'm going, what do I do? What do I do? I look this guy in the eyes, and I just go, so you can look me in the eyes right now and tell me you really believe in your heart that there is no God and that Jesus Christ is not the Son of God. And he just got quiet. And he goes, I know there's a God. He goes, I know, I know all of this stuff. I believe in God. My brother's a pastor. I grew up in a Christian home. But look at me, I'm all strung out on drugs, living on the street. I don't want anyone knowing I'm a Christian. He goes, it just... He started telling me about his life. And, uh, you know, I, I started getting to know this guy. I started meeting him every weekend. I'd go out there and hang out with J.D. And he'd take me around the, you know, the, the ghetto and in, into these alleys that just scared me to death. I mean, he took me down this one alley. You know, I'm just going, what am I doing here? You know, there's just dead rats everywhere. You're walking along, you know, and there's people laying there. And there was one time, and he just introduces me to all his friends out there. And they go, yeah, this guy Francis that I met. And I, this one guy go, he's a cop. And I go, I'm not a cop. I'm not a cop. I don't even like cops. You know, I mean, just, you know, I mean, I'm just scared. You know, it's like, what am I doing here? You know, but I begin this relationship with J.D. I get him a Bible, and he starts believing. He starts, you know, showing me, man, he goes, this is where, I remember this one week, he walked me in his corner, he goes, this is where I almost died. Some guy stabbed me and left me to die. He goes, and, and they took me to the hospital. Ambulance came. They stitched me all up, cleaned me all up, and threw me right back on the street. And he goes, and I remember asking God that day and saying to God, God, why didn't you just let me die? What's the point in my life? Why, why would you have me alive still? And he says, and I never knew the answer to that question until you came into L.A. that day, until you sat there and talked with me. He goes, it was like God sent you as an angel just for, um, just for me to tell me my life's not over and there's things to do. And I thought, no way. An angel? No one's ever called me an angel. <laughs> you know, this is so cool. Like, like, he really believed, like, God sent me that day to speak specifically to him, and it was going to change his life. He started preaching to everyone out there. He, he, I'd come back on the weekends. He goes, Francis, I walk around with this book, tell people about Jesus, and now everyone runs from me. <laughs> okay, good job. You know, <laughs> just, you know but he, he had life again. He believed again, and he starts sharing with everyone. Man, he even found the guy who stabbed him. He found out. He goes, man, he goes, friends, you never guess. I, I found out who, who stabbed me. I, I found out who almost killed me. I go, who was it? He goes, it was Michael. Michael was the chicken burrito guy. <laughs> then asked me, I go, the burrito guy? He goes, yes. And I go, what'd you do? He goes, man, a couple years ago, I would have taken him in the alley, and I would have killed him. He goes, but I was able to forgive him because Jesus has forgiven me. I thought, no way. It was just so cool, the whole experience, but I've learned in life. You know, it taught me such a valuable lesson. 
Because things like that don't happen to me all the time. Things like that happen to me every time I step out in faith, though. And I do something that's scary. And that's why I'm asking you right now, are you currently doing anything that scares you? Are you currently doing anything that requires faith where God has to come through for you? And if you're not doing it now, good luck with the rest of your life. This is the time you take some serious chances. This is the time you start believing that God can do some great things through you. It's while you're there on campus, while you're still in college. I mean, think about it. There's this passage, um, and, and this, this really hit me when I think about graduating from high school. Because uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, Ephesians 5, verse 15 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Do you see that? He goes, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. That phrase, he goes, make, make the most of every opportunity. Right now you've got an opportunity in college. He goes, but be careful because the days are evil. And it's this idea of, of uh, uh, the days and time being your enemy. It's, it's like this adversary that's coming at you. And he goes, be careful because the days are evil. They're, 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 they're like your enemy. Time is like your enemy. I, I never really felt that until, uh, until I graduated from high school. Remember high school graduation? A lot of people loved high school graduation. I honestly didn't like it because... It meant I had to start thinking. <laughs> you know how, like, your whole life you don't really have to think about anything, right? You, it just kind of laid out for you. I go to grade school, you know, do these tests, whatever. Same way all through high school, day in, day out. And then I remember when I was graduating, I just got sick because I thought, okay, I'm off on my own now. I got to decide what to do next in life. We always talk about, oh, I can't wait till I'm an adult. Wait, can't wait till I'm free. But then when you get there, you think, well, that's kind of weird. Like, people have expectations of me now. I have to make some serious decisions. And that was the first time that phrase hit me, the days are evil. Where did time go? Wasn't it kind of surreal when you walked the, that, that aisle, you know, the, the, the platform and got your diploma, and you thought, I'm done? No more high school? And what's crazy is if you look back at your yearbooks, you know, I was looking at my senior yearbook not too long ago, and you just read what people wrote. It's like, ah, best friends forever, you know, <laughs> keep in touch, KIT, you know, and, and write their phone number, let's get together this summer, let's be friends till we're old and gray. And I'm looking at these going, man, I never saw these guys again. <laughs> I never talked to them again. Here I was, friends with them, some of them since grade school, and now I don't see any of them ever again. And, and the truth is, is just like that scripture says, look, you better make the most of every opportunity. Think about all those people in high school that you didn't share with. And you figured, well, we'll be friends forever. He wrote in my yearbook. <laughs> it's a promise, and it never happened. It doesn't happen. When I was a junior in high school, I, I took my yearbook. When I was a junior, and I looked at all the seniors that were graduating, because I was a new Christian. And, and, and I looked at all the seniors that were graduating, and I thought, I'm never going to see these guys again. Some of these people I will never see again. I started calling every senior in my yearbook that I knew. And I go, hey, it's Francis. It's kind of weird. I know you're graduating in a couple weeks, but I thought, I, I, I'm never going to see you again. And i got to tell you, man, I'm, I'm, I've got to tell you about this relationship with Jesus. Because in my heart, I was thinking, these guys are going to go to hell. Hell. They're going to spend eternity facing God's wrath. And I love these guys. And I may never see them again. 
And so I just started calling and just going, man, I know this is weird getting a call from me, but I got to tell you about this because it's so real to me. God's really changed my life, and I got to tell you about this. And so it's so nice to look back at that yearbook and say, no regrets. No regrets. I just went a couple months ago to my 20-year high school reunion. You guys, that's so weird. You talk about time flying. That blew my mind as I'm driving. I'm going, I can't believe I'm going to my 20-year high school reunion in a minivan. You know, and I'm just, I was so cool back then. You know, it's just like, it wasn't that long ago. I was cool not that long ago. And now look at me. You know, it's just, life just goes faster and faster and faster and faster. That's why it's saying, you know, it's like this enemy that's just coming at you and you can't stop it. And do you understand that? I mean, are you feeling that at all yet? Just this little bit of, wow, high school's over? Man, college is going to get over so much sooner. And then your single year is going to be over and you're going to be, you know, standing on an altar getting married going, I can't believe this is already here. And you have a child and you go, no way. What do I do with this? I'm not ready for this. I don't know what to do with this thing. And you just start freaking out and then the kids start growing. I mean, it just flies by. It, it, that, that, that whole idea of this adversary, I like this illustration. It's like when I was a kid, I remember um, I remember going to this uh, church picnic. It was like a family gathering. Not eh, really family, but uh, Chinese people, we consider everyone as Chinese family. And what, you know, he said, call him uncle. Okay, uncle. You know, everything is just, you know, we would get these parties going and these picnics. And this one time, they always would get those big orange containers from McDonald's or yellow containers that have that orange drink in it. And um, with that little plastic button that you'd push and, you know, the drink would come out. And I remember at this one picnic, it was my turn, you know, so we were all happy. Oh, you know, happy drink. And I push the, the button, you know, to get my drink, and it gets stuck. And I'm trying to pound on it, but now it's overflowing. And I'm going, it's stuck, you know. And so everyone starts coming over and, you know, trying to fix it. And, if you know, you know, a lot of you guys are Asian. You know, you know how cheap we are, and we don't want to waste anything. And, and so for, for this to be spilling out and overflowing, this is like 40 cents of drink, you know, coming out. It's just, it's just, it's just nuts. So everyone's coming over, and, and everyone started getting their cups and putting it under because we weren't going to stop this thing. The, the, the punch was just going to keep coming out. And so everyone, he goes, get your cup, get your cup. And, you know, everyone <laughs> comes running over with their cups, you know, and there's a whole line, you know, so once one guy was done, the next guy would put his under and under under, you know, and then we drink it and come back and get more. And it was this whole idea of, you know, and finally the whole thing was, was gone. And we're like, oh, it's so good. You know, we didn't waste too much of it. You know, everyone's sitting there holding their cups with big smiles, you know. And, and, and I, I think about that illustration. It's, it's that same picture that the Bible is giving here of your time. Like right now, time is just coming at you right? You're not going to stop it. It's just ticking away. It's like this constant flow, and you can't stop it. The, the only thing you can do is to use it, you know, to make sure that you make the most. It's coming at you right now, so you have to think through. It says, live as wise people. Think through, God, right now, time is just flying at me right now. It's just pouring out of the spout. I can't stop it. It's just ticking, 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 and all I can do is try to grab it and use it somehow. And to think through, and he says, live as wise. Be very careful how you live. Think through, am I supposed to be in this seminar right now? Am I supposed to be sitting here and listening? Is this the best use of my time? Because it's coming at me, and I've got to somehow capture it and use it. Do you look at life that way? But it's because he says the days can be like your enemy. They're just coming at you, and, and you can't stop it. You've just got to somehow be careful how you live. Don't waste your time. Live as wise, not as unwise. Today, a whole day is going to pass by. How are you going to use it? Do you ever uh, use that expression? I don't know where the day went. You know, you hear it all the time, right? Gosh, it's already 5 o'clock. It's already 8 o'clock. Where did the day go? It's already Saturday. Where did the week go? 
And then it's like, man, are you kidding me? It's, two, it's 2006 already? You know, every year you, you go, what? I, I got to write 2007 on my checks? I mean, it just keeps going and it goes faster and faster and faster. And you start making these statements. Where did the time go? You graduate from high school and you go, where, where did that time go? It just came by so quickly. You guys, you don't want to come to the end of your life and say, where did my life go? What did it go toward? So going back to that punch illustration, there was a sense of fulfillment because we knew where all the punch went. There was a whole line of little Chinese kids you know, with smiles. It's like, ah, oh, there it all went. We succeeded. You know, that's, that's the way you want to feel about, I know it's a dumb illustration, but it, it, that's the way you want to feel about your time. You see, I can look back to high school and say, I don't have very many regrets. I don't ask myself, where did my time in high school go? I can go through the yearbook and say, I invested in this person, this person, this person, this person, this person, this person. These people, they grew in their walk with the Lord because I was able to spend some time with them while I was in high school. These people got to hear the gospel because I got to share with them while they were in high school. And so I look back at my high school years and I don't go, where did my time go? I go, it went into them. Same thing in college. You don't want to get through college and go, gosh, where did the time go? And go, well, it went into this degree. Yeah, that's fine. But you guys, there's so much more to that. And you don't want to, I, I, I talk to people on their deathbed all the time. And there's so much regret. People going, why did I spend my whole life paying a mortgage, worrying about making these payments and everything else and trying to come up with retirement and now I'm dying anyways? Why did I do that? And they look at their life and they go, what did I do with my life? And there's no answer. They can't look at a bunch of people and say, I know where my time went and went to him. Her, him, her, him, 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 her, her. I invested my life into them. They're different in their walk with the Lord because of the time they spent with me. That's the way you want to be, you know. And, and so the passage, it goes on. He goes, therefore, he goes, because the days are evil. Verse 17 says, therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. He goes, don't be stupid. Don't live your life so stupidly. Just, just going, well, what am I going to do today? I don't know, whatever. And just kind of cruise through life. He goes, that's a foolish, foolish way to live. He says, instead, understand what the will of God is. To really think through, God, what do you want? What is your will for me today? He goes, you've got to understand that. Don't just live life. He goes, live life carefully so that you understand what God's will is for you for that day. And then he explains how to know God's will. Here's the Lord's will, verse 18. He says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. First thing he says, after he says, understand the Lord's will, he goes, the Lord's will is that you don't get drunk on wine, but instead you get filled with the Spirit. It's interesting, it's interesting that he uses the analogy of getting drunk on wine, which probably none of you have ever done. Um, you know, but the whole idea of getting drunk you know, it's just that picture, if you've ever felt it, you know, just that buzz. I've only, I've only gotten drunk a few times in my life. I, I really, really one time only majorly, it was after a college Bible study. <laughs> it was awful, <laughs> and I was teaching it. It was, it was terrible. I mean, it's just sin. It was just dumb. You know, some people in there asked me, hey, you know, let's go out for a couple of drinks. I'm like, all right, all right. And there was this girl I liked and stuff, and then it just, uh, it was stupid. But I, I remember just going, man, I, I don't believe it. I was your pastor at that time. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's a Simi Valley community. Isn't that funny? All right. I'm going to tell on your mom. Okay. But, but the whole thing was, it, it just, it was awful. It was just like, gosh, what did I just do? But I remember um, going home and I had this roommate, Christian roommate. And, and I thought, I'm acting like an absolute idiot right now. And he's going to know. And I need to hide my sin, right? Because that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. <laughs> no, I'm kidding for the tape. That's a joke. And, uh, but I'm thinking, how do I hide this? You know, I'm in the back of the car, just laugh and go, Aah! you know, just everything is funny. Everything is, stu you know, just whatever, acting like an absolute idiot. And I knew it. And I knew it at the time. And I thought, he's going to know. And they dropped me off. And I just thought, okay, I got to just 
go as fast as I can, you know, just straight in my room, close the door and pretend I'm asleep so he doesn't come in and want to talk to me because he always wants to talk. And so uh, I just immediately just get in the house and just go right into the room, lay in my bed, put my head over the covers, go, don't come in. And sure enough, he comes in. He goes, hey, how was your night? Fine, I'm tired. You know, and I'm just fighting everything on my mind, going, don't say too much. He'll know. Don't, because you can't hide drunkenness, right? I mean, if, if right now I just, you know, I, I were drunk right here and I'm trying to hide it from you, it's just impossible, right? You, you, every, it impacts everything that I do, everything I would say, every way that I move. It would be influenced by alcohol. And what the scripture says, it says, don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. He says, have the Holy Spirit so alive in you that there's no way you can hide it. To where if someone spent 30 seconds with me, they should know there's something different about me, that I'm under the influence of something else. Just like a drunk person, like if I came into a restaurant drunk, and, and the waiter or waitress asks for my order, she'll know even as I'm giving my order that I'm under the influence of something. And the Bible says that's the way we ought to be with God. To where the waiter or the waitress, you know, sees me so filled with God's Spirit that she can't even take my order without going, this guy's different. There's something different about him. There's something different about her. I mean, wouldn't it be awesome to be those types of people? that are so filled with the Spirit of God that, that it's like being drunk. He influences everything we say, everything we do, to where people can just tell. And then he explains how we can do this, because being filled with the Spirit is something that uh, I, I think sometimes we have this misconception, like, well, it should just happen to me, right? Like it's this mystical thing, and that, but, but it isn't a, a one-time event. You know, people say, well, if you want to be filled with the Spirit, you've got to walk down an aisle. Someone's got to lay their hands on you. You'll fall over, shake, chew on the rug, you know, and, and you'll be filled at that moment. You know, you may even bark. You may do all sorts of things. That's being filled with the Spirit. And, and once you do it, then you're good. And it's like, no, that's not what this verb is talking about, this one-time event. But it's a command that says, be ye continually filled, nonstop. It's like if I got drunk right now, what would happen to me in about three, four hours? I'd be sober again, right? But it would take a lot of, what if I wanted to stay drunk? That takes effort, okay? That's, that's like, okay, I better just keep on drinking all through the day. I better, you know, oh, I'm losing, I'm losing, I better go. In the same way, you know, a lot of times we leave church and we go, oh, so filled, so on fire for God. What happens three hours later? You lose it. You're sober again. It's like, I, I lost it. And that's why the Bible's saying, be continually filled, and he explains how in, in the next verse. Um, in verse 19, he says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. See, in the Greek, it's explained, there's this one verb that, that's saying, you know, just be continually filled with the Spirit. That's your main goal. But then he gives you these participles and explains, this is how you do it. You want, do you want, I mean, don't you want to be a person who's filled with the Spirit to where everyone notices, you know, just they spend a little time with you and they're like, man, that guy's different. Have you ever met someone like that? Where it, where it doesn't take very long and suddenly you just realize, gosh, this person's so beautiful, so filled with joy, so filled with peace, just a few minutes with them. Don't you want to be that? Wouldn't it be cool if you just walk around campus? And see, that's why this whole, this whole talk isn't about, you know, hey, if you start a Bible and say like this, it's going to grow to this and this and this. I'm talking about if you really live a spirit-filled life, people are going to notice and you're going to impact lives. You really will. But he says the first thing you need to do if you want to live that spirit-filled life, he says is you need to start speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, what does that mean, to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? I mean, to speak to someone with a hymn, like, like if I wanted to, Juliana? And I mean, it doesn't mean I, when I see her, I go, How great thou art! No, no, that's not what it's saying. Because it's saying, speak. Okay, don't sing. Okay, don't go singing to me. <laughs> speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. What does that mean? What were the psalms? 
What were the hymns? What were the spiritual songs? What it was was a person sitting down and really writing out beautifully their praises for God, what they really wanted to praise God for. And what the Bible is saying is if, if you are serious about when to live a spirit-filled life, that means when you get together with other believers, you need to speak to them with these praises of God. Do you do that? When you get to other, with other believers, is the first thing out of your mouth praises that you have for God going, man, I got to tell you what God's done in my life. I got to tell you what happened in my, my week last week, what God did. I got to tell you what I read this morning and speaking to one another the things of God. As Christians, our speech so often is, is no different from those of the world. We just talk about the same types of things as they do. See, and yet the Bible says if you want to be spirit-filled, you have to do this. I mean, can you imagine how different your life would be if every time you ran into another believer, they came to you and shared what they were learning from God and their praises? Just picture that. Picture that on your campus. Every time a Christian walked by, it's like, hey, how's it going? Hey, good. Let me tell you what God taught me. Let me show you what I read this morning because it is so intense. Or, or, or to say, man, let me tell you what happened in my dorm last week. This guy, you know, you know, I've been praying for this and this happened. What if every Christian did that? And there was this Christian community where every time we got together, even with one other person, we would share the praises of God and we actually spoke to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Not only that, but then he goes on and then he says, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. He gives another thing. He goes, if you want to be spirit-filled, then do that. When you get together with one another, talk about God. He goes, not only that, but when you're alone. He goes, you, all day long, just keep singing in your heart to the Lord. You know, when you're in worship, you know, like when we're, we're about to go in and Chris Tomlin's going to lead worship in a little bit and you just get singing and you get so focused on God, right? And you just feel so spirit-filled in that moment. It's interesting because this, uh, this, this verb here for sing isn't the word like harmonize. You know, you know the difference between a harmony and a melody? You know, like, I don't know either. Okay, so don't worry about it. Um, but but the, 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 it's the idea of the melody is like the main uh, main. Thing. What, what's a song? A song. What, what, what did you, what, 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 name a song. I can't think of a song. How great thou art. I don't know, yeah. What, what do we sing? Um, not to us, you know. Not to us, but to your name be the glory. You know, that would be like the melody. And then there's the harmony, which would be, I have no clue. But it would just be like, not to us, not to you know. It kind of blends with it, okay? I, I don't know how to harmonize. But, but the whole idea of, of this, this verb is it's the melody. It's, it's, it's the whole idea of you're not joining another group, but it's you yourself singing out to God individually, the melody of the song, singing in your heart to the Lord. Do you guys sing throughout the day? Do you keep a song running in your head of worship to the Lord? I mean, the, the whole way from the hotel here, I was, I was singing. I can't even think of the song anymore. Oh, how great is our God. The whole time, you know, how great is our God. And the harmony would be, how great, you know. It, it, it's, it's, it's the whole time just going, how great is our God. Sing with me, you know, even though it's just me. That's how great is our God. And I just, you know, the whole way I'm walking up the stairs, you know, or the escalator, how great, how great is our God. You know, and just, just kind of, you know, I don't even know all the words. It's like, da, da, na, 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 na splendor of a king. You know, I'm just in my head, but I'm just trying to sing to God all day because I want to I wanna be spirit-filled. And so I want to keep singing to him all day long. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll stop as, as we're in this room and I'm talking because I can't talk and sing this melody in my head. This thing, but I try to keep it going all day long. Constant praise to the Lord. I mean, what if you did those two things? What if, what if every time you came together with another believer, they told you about their praises of God? What if you woke up in the morning and you just start singing to God and you have songs of praise to God all day long and constantly you're, you're, just, you're just focused on Him, fellowshipping with Him, singing to Him? Can you imagine how different you'd be? And then here, here's the last one we'll hit. And then, and then he says, verse 20, 
always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Think about these words. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. What if you woke up tomorrow morning and you never stopped thanking God through the whole day? Okay, you wake up and you go, God, thank you. I got another day of life to serve you, you know, and then you go brush your teeth, you know, and like, God, thank you. I get to brush my teeth, you know. I mean, it, seriously, people in Arkansas don't even have teeth. You know, it's like, oh, God, this is so good. I got running water. You walk out, you go, I'm in Hawaii. You know, look at the trees. Look at the sky. Look at the climate. Look at everything that's going on. God, this is so good. Thank you. You know, I get to go to class. And I actually get to, I mean, how many people get to go to college? I get to go to college. I get to learn, you know, to, to come in here and say, wow, I get to hear from the word of God, to leave here, to have lunch and go, wow, I get to eat right now. Thank you, God. Thank you for this food. I mean, seriously, thank you. I mean, how many people are starving right now and I get to choose what I eat? And, and then I'm going to another seminar and, you know, or a main session and we're going to be led in praise by Chris Tomlin and, and I'm going to join all these ministers here in Hawaii. And we're all going to sing to you. This is great. Then I'm going to hear another message. It's just everything, nonstop, for me to be in this room and go, no way, God, I get to stand up here and talk to college students and talk about how to be filled with the Spirit. You know, imagine if that's the way you lived your life. What if there were one individual on your campus that actually did these things, who actually just went and shared about God and his praises for him all the time? And, and, and someone who all through the day just kept singing to the Lord, worshiping Him. And all through the day just never stopped thanking God. Can you imagine how that person would just stand out on your campus? Every time he talks to a believer, it's about the things of God. He or she just never stopped singing to the Lord. He or she is just thankful for everything. That's how you start a movement on your campus. It starts with you being living a spirit-filled life. Forget the programs. Forget everything else. If you don't really stand out and you're not really different, there's no impact because who changes lives? Who changes lives? There's a question. Jesus, good. Good. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, you know? The Bible talks about how it's the Holy Spirit that has to come in and change someone. Otherwise, people are dead. But here's the problem. Where does the Holy Spirit live? Jesus. <laughs> no, where does the Holy He lives in us. See, and that's the whole thing. Is like, it's when we live a Spirit-filled life that it changes other people. The programs aren't going to change people. Events don't change people. The Holy Spirit changes people. So when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, guess what's going to happen? You're going to change people. When you live the Spirit-filled life, I mean, haven't you ever hung around a Christian who is so filled with the Spirit? I mean, just think about the godliest person you've ever hung out with. What do you feel when you're done with an experience like that? Jesus. Um, yeah, empty, good. You, you feel guilty, don't you? You almost want them to swear or something so you feel better about yourself, right? But you feel, you're like, gosh, that person is so godly. And you get convicted by them. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is convicting you. Why is the Holy Spirit convicting you? Because they're so filled with the Spirit. See, that's what's going to change people. It's when your life is different. You're living that life. The Holy Spirit's going to be out there, and he's going to start changing everyone around you. But, you know, most people will look at this passage and go, okay, that's great, but then you won't really do it. You'll leave this room and go, oh, that's cool. At least now I know how to be spirit-filled if I ever want to do it. But how many of us are really going to leave this room and try to just not stop thanking God? Like, thank God for everything. Okay, a lot of you guys came together 
And I encourage you tomorrow to, when you see each other, to say, hey, have you been thanking God for the last 24 hours? Because I have been, and here's, here's the things that have been going on. To get together and actually talk about the praises of God. And to ask each other, hey, have you been you know, trying to just keep a melody in your heart to the Lord, just singing to him nonstop? Guys, think about if we did this. Think about if everyone left this room and they were committed to those three things. Can you imagine how spirit-filled you would be if every day you checked up on each other and said, what has God taught you? Have you been thanking him all day long for everything, always giving thanks to everything? But the sad thing is usually Christians will come to a conference like this, take some notes, go, oh, that was cool, and then never do anything about it. And we deceive ourselves. We go, ooh, wasn't that a great conference? That's, that's so dumb. Last thing and then I'm done. It's, it's, like, it's like watching a football game. I don't know, I don't know if, uh, is UH any good? No. Yeah, not really. Who, who's the quarterback at UH? Colt Brennan. Let's say you go to UH game. Everyone's going crazy, you know, and you're at the stadium and you're so fired up and Colt Brennan gathers the team together and they're huddling. They go, break. Then they all run to the bench and sit down. Like, what was that all about? Then they come back out 30 seconds later, you know, and he calls another play. He goes, break. They all run to the bench. You're going, this is stupid. You know, th but you guys, that's exactly what Christians do. Okay, that, to me, that's the perfect picture of church every weekend. You've got a pastor that comes up and says, hey, you guys, here's the play we're going to run, okay? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to leave here. We're going to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. We're, you know, we're going to you know, make a melody to the Lord, and then we're going to give thanks, like nonstop giving thanks. You guys ready to do it? Okay, break. And then you go, and you sit down, and you never do these things. And you go, ooh, I can't wait till the next huddle. <laughs> I can't wait for Bible study next week. He's going to call another play. No one's going to do it. And then we're going to come back again. But we went. We went to this conference. We went to, you know, this lecture series. It was the best. And I can't wait till they do it again next year. Because that's exactly what the Christian world looks like today in America. And then we wonder why the unbelievers look at us and go, that's stupid. That's stupid. I don't want to watch this. They're tired of us talking, calling plays, huddling together in our little groups, and then going out and doing nothing. And so my prayer is that when you leave this room, man, it's not just another stupid huddle where another play was called. And you go, okay, that's cool. I know how to be spirit-filled now. Let me add that to the playbook and the number of plays that I know. I'm saying, let's go out and actually do something, actually play ball, actually, you know, live this way. And as we live in that type of community on our campuses, it's going to be contagious. It really will. I, I don't know if the world, I don't see people say, well, people are so against Jesus and so resistant to Christianity. I don't know if people actually are resistant to Jesus or if they've just never seen him. They just see American Christianity. And yeah, that's, that's very unattractive. You guys, don't. Don't seek to just do better than everyone else around you. Seek to be the real thing, to live this out. What, what time do we have right now? 11.27. Okay. Well, then can I say one more thing? And then we'll be done. Okay. You probably heard this online. Um, she listens to me when she runs. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, when I was in college, I went to, uh, went to Hong Kong. Have you heard that one yet? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I went to Hong Kong. <laughs> she, she stalks me. Um, but uh, <laughs> I went to Hong Kong because <laughs> I wanted to see where I grew up, right? And, uh, you, you know, because I grew up there when I was really little. And, and I went back in college. And uh, my grandma, you know, took me all around Hong Kong. And she would introduce me to all my relatives and people I didn't know, people that I grew up with that I didn't know about. But and all her friends, she just wanted to show me off. But every time we ran into someone, they would say the exact same thing. 
to me. Every time she introduced me to someone, they would look at me and go, wow, gom dai jie ka, you know, <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, wow, he's so big. <laughs> it was just everyone, everyone would say, wow, he's so big. I'm only 5'9". But everywhere I went in Hong Kong, this expression was the same. Wow, you so big. <laughs> and I didn't have the heart to tell him, it's not that I so big, <laughs> it's that you so small. You know, like everyone here is so tiny, you know? And, and in your corner of the world, everyone's so small, so I just look big. You know, that's the reality of it all. And, and I, I say that because I, I feel like in America, we live in the most materialistic, self-centered, arrogant, ungodly place. And so the moment we do anything for God, we look like a saint. And everyone say, ooh, you're so godly. You know, you, you're so spiritual. And it's like, well, it's not that I'm so spiritual. It's just that the American church is just so ungodly. I mean, when I read the New Testament, don't you sometimes read the New Testament and wonder if we're all fooling ourselves? When you look at what the believers did back then that would just do anything for the Lord and sell everything and live by faith, don't you sometimes look at a, even in a conference like this and see all these ministers and go, are we getting it? Are we all missing it? So I'm looking at the early church here, and these guys were ready to die for their faith. And yet here on our campus, if someone said, hey, I said Jesus this morning in class, we go, no way, you said Jesus? Ah, that's great. You know, it's just this whole thing of like, wow, you're a saint. Why? Because you mentioned his name, you weren't ashamed. You know what I mean? Doesn't it seem like we just lift up these people for when you look at the Bible, go, man, some, it happens in church when they get older. Whoa, you gave 11% of your income this week? Crazy, we're going to name the church after you. We're <laughs> Billy Baptist now. It's just this whole dumb, you know, and, and you look at the scriptures and you go, man, these guys gave their lives. They were so spirit-filled. They were living in another world. And, uh, you know, Jesus would say a lot of things and then say, you know, he who has ears, let him hear. Because he knew not everyone's going to get this. Some people, whoosh, it's going to be right over their head. But he who has ears, let him hear. And I'm just saying, man, I don't know. I don't know if I get it sometimes when I read the New Testament and I see the commitment level. But I don't want to come to the end of my life realizing that I fooled myself. And I just compared myself to a bunch of little Christians and thought I was godly. But when in reality, I was living in a corner of the world where everyone was so materialistic that any sacrifice seem like this spiritual giant step. And so I pray that as you leave here, that you really will take the words of Scripture and live them out completely. Say, you know what? It doesn't matter that people don't give thanks at all. I want to give thanks always for everything. It doesn't matter that other people don't want to talk about God. I will be that person that will speak about Him. I don't care if other people don't sing to God all day long and it's just during worship. I'm going to keep this melody. I may even be humming out loud. I may even be singing out loud as I walk to class. I want to be in the zone. I want to be the real thing and not just think that I'm okay because I'm comparing myself to so many people who are spiritually dead. You guys stick with Scripture. Look at what God calls you to be and nothing else. Let me just pray for us and then um, we'll close this up. God, I thank you. I want to I thank you right now that there's students in this room that came here and wanted to hear the word of God. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that we live in a country that allows us to just sit here and talk about you and dwell on you. I, I thank you that we're a part of a conference where we're just hearing some great messages from just men of God that are getting on that platform and really impacting us. I thank you that we're going to get to worship in a little bit. I thank you that we get to eat in a little bit. God, eating's great. It's just, it's just everything you created in this world, laughter, everything is so good. 
And Father, I thank you for these students that they get to go back to their campuses and that there's still time and they're still alive and they still have these friendships that are still there. And I thank you, God, they got to hear the word. And I pray that as they leave, they really will apply it and just give nonstop thanks and praise to you. Father, you're so good to us. We have nothing to complain about. We're your children and you love us. Yet there's a work to be done. But God, it starts with us. May we really live spirit-filled lives. And as we do that in community, would our campuses see it and envy it and long for it? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give him a hand. You guys want to ask any questions before we um, end the session? We'll take one or two. Yeah. We'll take two questions. Uh, the, the Bible verse was Ephesians 5, uh, starting verse 16 to uh, like 20-ish, 20 2021. 20, I didn't get through it all. Actually, the last participle under that main verb of be spirit-filled is um, um, submit to one another out of fear of the Lord and talking about your relationships too. Yeah, just so, just so you know, I don't think I'm a heretic. What else? If you have any more questions, then you can um, come up and ask uh, yeah. Pastor Chan after. Um, just to remind ask you, Brenda, she knows everything. Yeah, I know. we can ask Brenda. She'll tell you more. Uh, just to remind you guys, the evaluations you can put in the back end. Uh, and uh, how many people are in college right now? How many people are in, in high school? Okay, I guess I'll, share with, I'll, sh I'll end with a story. Um, happened in my own life. In 2003, I went to Australia to do my master's in public health, and uh, the funny thing was that. When you, I think one thing that you, part, you, you said today about living a spirit-filled life, I basically went to school to invite people to Bible study. And I was the dumbest guy in all, all of my classes, uh, the youngest and the dumbest. Um, but I, all I did was just come to school, invite people to Bible study. And, and in Australia, it was very interesting because we had a lot of Mideastern people there. And even had a lot of Arabic people come with their Quran to our Bible study. And I just saw God move in such you know, great ways. And um, I think when you really put God first in school, he's there to bless you. Um, after the 10 months in graduate school in Australia, finished the whole degree within 10 months, uh, master's in public health. And I think God has a great destiny for all of you guys when you put him first in school, and he's, he's sure to bless you. So have a good day. Take care, and God bless.